welcome to another Dividend Cafe, uh, this time uh, with my full investment committee. Uh, to my left, Dea. To my right, Brian. You guys know both of them. Uh, I don't think we've been able to do this together in the studio since the beginning of the year. And uh, we're all here in Newport Beach together, uh, just in time to talk about Russia going to war with Ukraine. Uh, it's been a very volatile first quarter in markets. We obviously predicted exactly all of this. You know what's funny? Actually, we kind of did predict some of it, right? Like a lot of the energy theme and the value over growth and the kind of uh, frothiness and shiny objects. All, a lot of those things that we talked about two and a half months ago, they've been coming to fruition. But the military escalation in Russia, Ukraine, and what that represents in commodity markets and, and otherwise, both geopolitically and macroeconomically, that obviously couldn't have made the uh, beginning of the year coverage. So we're just going to sit here and have a little conversation for our Dividend Cafe listeners and viewers. And I'll start with you, Brian, um, with the caveat that none of us can exactly know. What is your uh, best expectation for markets? And I mean, in this case, U.S. equity markets, because obviously Forex and, and commodities and rates could all be different. U.S. equity markets out of the Russia-Ukraine situation, short term. <clears throat> what do I think will happen after as we come through th through, through the skirmish? Um, or, or the best case? Th what I mean, do you think the, the best case scenario is? Yeah, well, you can uh, you can answer that too. Okay, so so yeah. best case scenario, um, some sort of re resolution has uh, you know is is found, and uh, conflict subsides, and markets get a little desensitized to the volatility. But volatility has already been coming down a little bit. Um, but it's still over 30. You know, the VIX is still over 30. So best case scenario, we have fundamentals start to come in um, that start to trump some of the jitters on war uh, volatility. And I think um, fundamentals technically should be pretty good um, uh, coming through earnings season, next earnings season. So um, now that's calling for something to happen over the next couple of months. And so maybe that's wishful thinking, but you said best case scenario. So that's how I would answer that. <laughs> okay. Um, getting through the skirmish and having fundamentals start to trump uh, jitters. Dea, same question. Yeah, I uh, obviously the the market is is pressing very hard and very and hoping very much there is a deal uh that uh Zelensky and uh, and Putin can come to the negotiating table and make a favorable deal. Uh, why do you think, why do you think the market is hoping for that? What makes you think Well, that? I well, I think the market the mar market's like Peace. Markets like certainty and as long No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Okay. I mean specific. Okay. The market's like peace and not having all the uncertainty and bad sure. stuff. But you were specific that you think what the market's wanting is Putin and Zelensky to have a, a, a breakthrough that brings the peace. And is that, is that just because that seems like the most obvious way it could happen? Or do you think the market particularly wants it to happen that way? Uh, is, is there a different avenue that can... In Really, anything that can ensure that the situation is stable and that is not that it is not going to escalate. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I, to me it seems like the easiest way to achieve that would be some sort of deal between those two heads of state. Uh, maybe there's another avenue where uh, where they overtake Kiev and maybe Zelensky's not uh, part of that uh, that negotiation. I, I don't know, but to me, as far as the best case scenario and what the market hopes will happen, I, I think. Uh, will be will, will be both of those heads of state m make a deal, and then uh, it ensures some sort uh, some sort of peace. And the really the potential for uh, escalation doesn't exist anymore. I think that th that's what the market is concerned about is maybe maybe this isn't a, exactly a uh, a state that is sustainable, and it might uh, and might escalate. So I think that that would be the best case scenario. The deal, as, as Brian mentioned, along with maybe some um, some central bank. Uh, dovish, dovishness in the U.S. Uh, I think uh, I think would ha would help risk assets help help the equity market. Hmm. Um, so, do you if that's what you think the market is waiting for or hoping for is a Putin Zelensky uh, deal? Do you think the market's going to be disappointed if the deal does not happen? Yeah. I think as long as we're as long as Russia and Ukraine are engaged in this conflict at this level, uh, I think the market is going to be disappointed. Um, because the the potential for escalation exists. Do you think that if that scenario played out, <clears throat> that the sanctions would come off? Um, I I think the sanctions, at least the majority of the sanctions, maybe not all, but there's a a permanent uh, 
break between Russia and the Western nations. I don't, I don't see how this relationship will be prepared in the near to intermediate term. Maybe if, uh, maybe if there's some sort of regime change in Russia, but I think as far as Russia from the Western economy, I think there is a, uh, a practically permanent decoupling. Yeah. yeah, and so I wonder if um, the markets know that and believe that and that they have to price in what that could look like and then the spectrum of what that looks like becomes the next bigger issue as opposed to some sort of resolution. Uh, you know, it, it strikes me as obvious that the market would want de-escalation and some, some kind of a sign of uh, mm. a cessation of escalation, even if it isn't de-escalation. Just like if there's some sort of uh, reason to believe things don't get any worse, that becomes very helpful. However, um, I, I have a hard time believing that a lot of market actors think that that's going to come from Putin and Zelensky hugging it out. Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly. It, you know, scenario building in this very uncertain geopolitical environment, I think is a very difficult exercise. At least, at least for me, I don't claim, claim to be a geopolitical expert. And I don't know what the scenario is for a cessation in a potential escalation could look like. And uh, you, you're, you're right. It doesn't have to be Zelensky and Putin hugging it out. Uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's Ukraine is completely invaded and they they uh, they finally give up. And that that could also be uh, also give some stability for markets. But th there's the scenario building is very difficult. And then there's, there's attaching the probabilities to different scenarios is also equally as difficult that I don't. I don't pretend to uh, to know, uh, you know, at all, or or, or pretend to know. So uh, we've yeah, had it's we've had conflicts around the globe that have last that just sort of didn't stop. That like they didn't deescalate, right? Uh, but they like Russia and Afghanistan just kind of went on for like a decade, and Iraq and Iran in the '80s were at war kind of the whole time, and. Um, it's a little different now, and this does invite in NATO. It invites in the West. It invites in the U.S. to some degree. I mean, I'm a little surprised at the response on some of that because there is this talk as if a lot of people are wanting to prep the U.S. to go to war, and there's just very little sign of that to me. Um, but in theory, could Russia and Ukraine just sort of be in a guerrilla warfare conflict that lasts for many years, and at some point the markets quit caring. Yeah, and that that was sort of my point with looking at the volatility index and, and how much the markets are caring with the current, you know, situation that's going on. Over time, if things sort of stay the same, eventually markets sort of get used to it, honestly, mm -hmm. and, and we kind of start going back. And that's why I said, you know, if it's if that's what's going to happen, Russia invades, maybe Russia is somewhat successful, maybe the big cities fall, like Kiev. <clears throat> Are they going to be able to occupy and run that country the size of Texas with 40 million people in it over time? I, I don't think so. Um, but, you know, um, having just kind of more of the same go on, uh, markets will eventually get kind of used to it. And then you'll have, you know, earnings that are going to come out that are going to be positive. You know, I think inflation will end up kind of peaking here at some point this year and start to go the other way. I bet the Fed will be a little bit more dovish than what the market had priced in. I mean, the market was pricing in like nine rate hikes at one point. Yep. Um, I'd be surprised if we see three. Um, Yep. I, I totally agree with that. There'll be just a natural desensitization. And I and I think it's it sounds like a rational thing on the side of markets. I mean, at the end of the day, the longer time goes on with this conflict, uh, you know, say, staying isolated in Russia, Ukraine, it, it means that those knock on effects that we might be worried about as far as linkages go between Russia and international trade and, you know, the bond market defaulting X, Y and Z is less likely to happen uh, the long if we haven't seen it and the longer this conflict persists uh you know so in addition to a potential escalation uh so so i it, it makes a lot of sense to me the 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 whole idea of desens desensitizing to the russian ukraine conflict or the, or the market seeing it that way i don't know how long it'll happen but uh it sounds very likely if, if it doesn't de-escalate in the next five months potentially it never de-escalates and that's the market's view on it yeah, I think that um, we're already – it may not be five months, but one thing has already happened that is irreversible in my opinion. And that is like if, to those who believe Russia will inevitably be able to overpower in Kiev, I, I don't necessarily disagree. I'm not totally sure I do agree, but it, it's plausible. It's probably the the most likely scenario at some point, but I don't think it matters. I think that no matter what, there's no way Russia looks good. No. There's no way Russia looks powerful. You had to do this in, in like a day and a half to show the world your might. And if you end up taking, at this point, it'll be three weeks. That's way too long. But like, 
you know, like like if I fought like a, a professional boxer, you know, and then he's like, yeah, I got beat him, you know, like a, it was a, t- a judge's uh, decision. You'd pull it off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like, and then the judges are like, yeah, the, that boxer beat David for sure. But I go twelve rounds. I'm still the winner. Absolutely. You know what I mean? No. And it's... and I just made up that analogy right now. That was we we would have your back in that fight, by the way, just so you know. But I think I think Definitely. that that wouldn't help because I think all of us would get beat up. <laughs> no, I think the three of us could do it. But all I'm saying is that all I'm saying is that that's not like good for the pro boxer. If if some financial guy who's 48 and overweight goes 12 rounds with them, Kiev at this point by not going to Russia in two days. One of Putin's uh, is not his only strategic initiative, but one of his mandates out of this is not possible to achieve, which is to demonstrate Russian power and might to the West. No matter what, they look um, uh, weak. They look feeble. They look incapable. They look incompetent. They look ill-prepared for fighting a war in the modern era. And so that, to me, actually adds incentive. Now it's not face-saving because you can't save face. You, now it's Maybe there's more motivation to get into some off ramp, but I just don't believe the off ramp comes from Zelensky. What, what if the what? What about the other side of that, um, where Russia says essentially it's going according to plan? <laughs> what else are they going to say? Yeah. Uh, but but the other side of it is also that it really isn't a uh, full 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 scale invasion. Uh, Russia is proceeding incrementally. Uh, you know there is a lot of you know in order to quell any sort of domestic opposition. Uh, you know, a lot of Putin's inner circle and a lot of Russians have a lot of family in Ukraine. And, you know, obviously they, they, they go back a lot of ways of practically the same people. And in order to limit the civilian casualties, Russia is proceeding very slowly and doesn't want to uh, to to show their entire military might and completely destroy Ukraine, uh, you know, on day three for because it, because they don't want to stir domestic. Opposition. Oh, do you, oh, they can't they can't spin that at this point. Yeah, okay. I think the cat's okay. out of the bag. Uh, they kind of got the worst of everything they probably wanted. Mm-hmm. They got a, a unification of the West more than anybody ever dreamed was possible. I think, um, you know, and 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 so at this point, yeah, I mean, it's taken far longer than than. And so whether that was part of it, maybe they're going a little slower, maybe they're being more incremental. I kind of get that, but I, I don't fully buy that would be the the style necessarily that they would want to go for to show the world stage that, hey, we, we really matter, even though their economy is a $1.5 trillion economy in the world, which really doesn't matter, frankly. <clears throat> um, economically, it doesn't. So, mm-hmm. But, you know, sanctions that are this tough over a long period of time, you've got to worry about destabilization of the country itself over time. Um, so, Of the country or of NATO? No, of, of, of Russia. You know, oh, I, I, oh, I see. I, 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 I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I, Putin is beloved in the country for the most part, um, from what I've read and from the Russians that I speak to, um, including yeah. one today. Um, but that's starting to change, even. And that was perspective I got today from speaking to someone there. Yeah. Um, which he's, I thought he was, seems I, to be I, beloved I, with some people in our country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no freaking idiots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Russia's destabilization doesn't have this like shock and awe situation to markets, but then over time you think it could sort of have a bad impact in the global economy. It's been so contained now. I just, you know, we talk about the currency crisis in the late nineties and all of these different things we've gone through where it it rattled world markets in a bigger way. Now the sanctions and and all of this containment has already happened. So now if there's an implosion, I sort of feel like it's isolated almost, you know, and and it, 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 it it would move world markets. It absolutely would. Um, I just we don't just know talk that they... candidly about what they contribute to the global economy, and not and I'm not being rude or mean or pejorative or sarcastic, but like just brass tacks, like as a person reading a spreadsheet would re- read it. Like world trade. Energy, Does anybody energy, care about energy, anything wheat. besides energy? Energy, weed, yeah. and vodka. Okay, even Although wheat, we do even make wheat, even wheat, they were much less than I thought they were. Caviar. Um, oh really? Okay. Much less. What 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 are the numbers? It was like nine like percent. Uh, it was like fourth place. Russia and Ukraine combined? Because Ukraine's the fifth largest. Yeah, but I mean, we're talking about Russia's destabilization. Like in the end, we're not talking about the 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 volatility around commodity prices now, but a perpetual situation of Russian instability. So I would that assumes that one way or the other, one of those countries is still kind of alive and kicking, right? I'm saying a, a sustained period of economic distress for Russia has an oil and gas import and and to some degree wheat but what else 
That's it's energy. That's pretty this, much it. Yeah. The story is energy. They've already been contained economically from a currency perspective. Um, yeah, do European banks have exposure to sovereign debt in Russia? They do. But we've already gone through a financial crisis, and they they were turned into court of zombie banks with the ECB. But but it's not going to be that bad, and they've already sort of seen that that play out before and deal with it. You know, as far as having sovereign debt be trading at you know thirty cents on the dollar, that type of a thing. I I I completely agree. I think that if you look at all those numbers, uh, I think they're they're pretty low. Although I I and I'm not sure. Can how I to clarify my head. real sure, quick? Sure. I don't want to lose Brian's point. Okay. Banks with exposure to Russian debt—that's a systemic or contagion risk. Sure. Are you sure it's banks or is it asset managers? Oh, I mean, you're, I see here in the country it's PIMCO. You're saying yeah. it is. Well, okay. asset managers aren't leveraged themselves typically. Um, they can be. You know, a bank can also be an asset manager. But I mean, is there contagion risk from European sovereign bank, uh, sovereign debt exposure? Uh, I, I, there may be. I just don't know. I haven't looked at it. I figure. I don't think it's enough. I, okay. I think there are I some, I don't but I just so. don't, I don't think it's enough to yeah. up uproot the, the trajectory of economic growth that is going on right now. Yeah. I don't think that alone would do it. I think it's been yeah. too contained, and I don't think it is exists enough. I, I agree. I think it's good good analysis. And I think that some of the bad analysis I'm hearing and reading is people that are saying, like, oh, 1997, yeah. Russian, uh, or 1998, Russian default – uh, really threatened. It brought down long-term capital management. It's like that was very different. It, yeah. it, there, there's a sequence of events that had a specificity to it at a given moment in time and place, and so you take one act from the play and jump, put it into a different play, and you act like the whole play is going to go the same way. It doesn't work that way. I've said that about time and time again. Very few people could be as bearish as I am on where U.S. residential housing prices will be relative to right now in two or three years. But I go out of my way to say that is categorically different than predicting the financial crisis. Absolutely. Because the credit dynamics are different, the leverage dynamics, the bank balance sheets, the non-bank lenders. There's just simply no sim – but me just saying a sticker price of a home could be down 15 percent doesn't imply the same contagion risk. And people talk about what happened last time Russia had something. And if anything, I think it's fascinating. That's the last time Russia had anything. Mm -hmm. Because it's because no one's cared for twenty five years. It's, yeah, no, that's a great point. It's a great analogy, actually. It's that 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 things are different now than than they were in the late nineties. Um, with it, and frankly, like I said, I, you know, I won't be a broken record. We've already isolated them now. So it, so whatever's going to happen there, can it destabilize the rest? Maybe, but it's pretty contained. We're in the late nineties. That wasn't like that at all. What's your yeah. take, Dad? Do you think that there is um, a risk of Russia? Uh, bringing down global uh, economic metrics because of their distress. Uh, it's I I I agree with uh, with all your analysis on the subject. I think if you look at the numbers and the percentage of uh, some of this debt on all these banks, I think it's very very low. At the end of the day, what I think creates uh, contagion risk is the leverage linked a lot to a lot of these products, and I I don't think that's there. Uh, long term capital management, I, I believe that was a very heavily leveraged situation. Uh, it was it was ninety nine to one. So you okay. know, it's yeah, like, it's, like, yeah. it's like bear, bear stearns, <laughs> the same as bear. That's not too. That's not too bad. <laughs> ninety nine to one. Okay, okay. That was just, uh, even more than uh, two thousand eight. And even uh, then, it was it wasn't direct exposure to Russia. It, people don't even understand what really happened. But I, I won't bore our listeners. But it was more allegedly that Russian default led, led to other. In, in anomalies in the treasury rate market, and then that's where long-term capital's exposure was. There were other uh, peripheral circumstances that had dominoes, but it wasn't that like long-term capital was ninety-one to one levered on Russian debt directly. Oh, yeah. 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 Sure, sure. No. Yeah, it was, it was some sort of. Rel rel I'm sure that it was a, a highly mathematized or mathematized kind of uh, yeah. spread situation yeah. or something. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think there's a huge, uh, as far as financial markets go, it does not appear to me that there is uh, the likelihood of contagion risk um, from everything I've seen. I mean, you know, if, if, if escalation happens and this thing really gets ugly, I'm, I'm, I don't want our listeners to know. I, I am not saying I'm painting a rosy picture here. Uh, there are very few ways in which this goes in, in such a way that it doesn't affect markets at all. But I just think that from a contagion risk to the rest of the world economy, the Russian economy itself, I don't think poses that risk. But that doesn't mean the risk of escalating the largest nuclear force in on Earth isn't a it isn't a risk. It's definitely a risk, and that's why you're seeing volatility the way it is. Well, I know yeah. it's a risk because the Atlantic ran something that said if there was a nuclear war, it would be terrible for for climate change. <laughs> so, perfect. Obviously, there's risk out there. Yeah. yeah, we live in a really weird 
world, man. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I, there's stuff that I climate change is a risk. I just don't even. I believe. Yeah. Like if someone said, I'd like to pay you to be like kind of a, a comic writer and come up with stuff that's sort of funny and dry and sarcastic and clever and, and everything. I, some of the things that really get printed on both the right and the left at times is like the stuff I'd want to come up with. <laughs> but the headline actually literally said that yeah. a nuclear war could kill millions of people, but also it could be bad for the climate. And I just thought <laughs> that's an odd, it's odd copy, you know, yeah. it's an odd copy. I don't know how to say it. Uh, So let me give you a very contrarian take. I happen to really believe this, but I am totally okay if I'm uh, in outer space on it. I want you to call me out with your your own honest perspective. This is not my prediction, but this is a right tail risk. And so for listeners, what I mean by that are low probability, high impact events, but we constantly talk about that in finance around the left tail, which is to say negative. So a return would go far negative on the left side of a bell-shaped curve, and it would go way higher on the right side of a bell-shaped curve. But on both sides, as you get further out from the middle, you're dealing with less likely events that are higher impact. So right tail is generally what people love, but of course, it's kind of like winning the lottery. This is somewhere on the right side of the tail. Mm. Is it possible that out of this mess, Russia-Ukraine ends up stopping in it and how it matters to markets, whether because there's a resolution, whether it's because we get used to it or whatever. But what sticks is a Western realization. And by Western, I mean European, American, I mean DC, I mean independence moderates, a pretty bipartisan American and European acceptance of the need for US energy to play the predominant role and energy needs Europe and U.S. together say, let's get your LNG exports going. Europe gets more ready to receive them, to import. U.S. gets more ready to export. Terminals get built. Millions of jobs, uh, billions of dollars of contribution to GDP, and significant geopolitical leverage. This is not going to happen by October. It can't happen really even in a couple of years. But is there possible out of this that no matter how it ends, the realization that the U.S. needs to be the predominant actor in world energy markets gets baked in in places that otherwise would not have got baked in. I I do think that that is an absolute. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you know, having Europe import liquid liquefied natural gas from a friend versus a foe it would be a benefit to them. I think that the cost technically could be very much on par, if not better, than what they're already used to. Um, I think the supply is there. You're right. It takes a few years to turn on. Um, I think it's better for the environment over time, technically, um, you know, versus some dirty, bur- dirtier burning fossil fuels um, as we maybe transition into a greener future many, many, many years from now. But um, I think it's a right tail risk, whether it's a right tail risk as a boom or it's a right tail risk that just kind of slowly but surely builds steam. I'd probably take the latter. Where, it, but we've set the stage for it already. Yeah, I I really like that picture you painted. As as as, as rosy it was, I think it's uh, it's rationally so. I don't know. Uh, you know, obviously Europe uh, realizes some of the Nordic two pipeline stuff they they did with uh, or Germany with and Russia realizes that was a strategic mis- mistake, and they will aim to diversify their energy needs away from Russia. And I don't know what those options look like, but, uh, you know, obviously uh, U.S. Uh, being the, you know, largest exporter, I assume, uh, I, I assume will be part of that equation. Talk about a way to balance the trade deficit. You right. Know? Yeah. I mean, you know, in this country. And, right. what, you know. Um, it would be all uh, exports be unbelievable. And, and no corresponding imports. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it I, I like it. I, I mean, I think, um, like I said, whether it's as how, do, how does this end in a way where it's sort of like you think about other things that happened and then they went away and yet people still learn some lesson. Now, it is true. We don't always learn our lessons forever. You know, sometimes things we, we learn for a few years, we end up forgetting. Mm-hmm. But it would seem to me that the lesson of um, like, I don't know that we're going to ever go back. To saying like we don't want to make uh, hand sanitizer anywhere but in China, like like I think there's some people that are like, hey, for now on, let's go ahead and open up a little plant like in in Indiana, you know, just to, for next time, mm. COVID twenty three or something, mm. and and I think that this is one of these moments in which 
you know, we're not going, people cannot go back to 100% financing of their homes anymore, right? Like it was just, okay, we're not doing that anymore. It's too, it's not only from a regulatory standpoint, but just the sensibility of it economically changed. And I think that right now you cannot escape the fact that a few days ago, oil was at 125 and looking to go to 150. And that was before Russia was really cut off from world oil markets. Europe has still not, as of time that we're recording, Europe has still not banned imports of Russian oil and gas. And if they were to, you could very well get get close to two hundred dollar oil for a short period of time. And so I don't think I don't think people um, are going to change their mind. Like, okay, that seems kind of dumb. And so I I just I know for sure there's wishful thinking in this because. I have been beating this drum for a very long time that economically and geopolitically and environmentally, this is the right course of action, that we will be the cleaner burner, a cleaner emitter of carbon than other competing countries and that we will represent a uh, better technological solution to reducing uh, carbon out of fossils and that natural gas is a, a cleaner fossil than coal that electricity production is going up, not down, and it requires you know, this production mechanism. All of these things are indisputable to me. And I just wonder if I, the political dialogue was so nasty, the polarization, some of the arguments that get presented are so emotive and sometimes so incoherent, and that it took Putin for people to be like, okay, I don't want to be tethered to that guy. Now, what's, why do I say right tail risk instead of saying this is a consensus view? Because candidly, we kept our dependency on Middle Eastern oil for decades when it was clearly not in our geopolitical interest either. But I think most of that was pre-fracking. Yep. I think most of that was before we had the ability, the known ability to actually get our, our production level up to the more or less in line with the same level of barrels per day that we produce. It could be more or less in line with the barrels per day we consume. Mm -hmm. And um, so the world's changed a bit. That's my take. Yeah, and and I, I agree. I like your analogy of, of saying once you kind of go a certain path, it's hard to go back, um, especially with that kind of investment in infrastructure that you would need to kind of build that out. That's what I mean. I'm not sure if it happens overnight, but I just think that politically right now, there's more appetite for it. And yeah. and ultimately, there's more unification uh, because there's a very common interest for, you know, for us all to, to have this kind of national security issue off the table. And also, economically, it makes a ton of sense. And also, it's environmentally friendly. Um, on a relative basis. Um, All right. So what's the over under on how long it takes till we start seeing serious white papers and serious Wall Street analysis and serious uh, asset manager perspective that the hidden treasure, the real right tail risk of Russia, Ukraine is that it will cause the Fed to not tighten as much. <laughs> um, I think this analysis is coming. Um, when will it come? And uh, what do we think about it, Dan? It seems to it seems to me the rhetoric the rhetoric that I hear from the Fed is that they are fairly resolute on the winding down of their balance sheet, and uh, although you know obviously the linkage between uh, the Treasury and the Fed has grown closer and closer throughout the years, uh, they've sounded pretty consistent uh, in, in that messaging. So I, I I don't know how how bad you know the certain economic realities need to be affected for the Fed to get to the level where they they kind of let off the gas a little bit. Not just as far as the the rate hikes go. We I, are, I do. We already. I can tell you if you want to know. The, the, tell me the uh, how long it takes. What it would take for the Fed to uh, throw in the white towel. Uh, inflation coming down. Nope. Um, well, that will be the cover, but um, okay. Because you're saying an economic event, like you have to get bad economically, and then they have to reverse, and I. Think it would be nothing more than credit spreads, really? Okay, that would, that would that would be all it takes. But that's because I don't believe them, and you. It sounds like you sort of do. I I, I generally uh, I I just think that they're kind of backed into a corner because of the inflation readings. Um, but I do believe that. So that's the consensus view, which sounds like it's your view is the Fed really wants to tighten, and and even if they didn't, they're backed into a corner because of inflation. But then Russia, Ukraine, maybe they want to kind of not tighten because it's economically volatile, but then it exacerbates inflation and commodity prices. So that really all the more backs them into corner. Ergo, the Fed just has to tighten and see what happens. I think they'll be looking at core inflation uh, readings uh, a little bit more. Um, but but I, I, I don't know what inflation's how inflation is going to proceed going forward. I assume that as it comes off those higher base months, it'll it'll be you'll start to see disinflation more and more. Um, 
But as far as uh, as far as what the the uh, event has to be economically, it, you may be right. It just uh, some credit spreads blow out a little bit, and all of a sudden, uh, all the, all that rhetoric and all that messaging is totally forgotten, and they decide to ease. And I should or, be. I want to give you a little more clarity because I may have been unfair today. I am not referring to what the Fed will say is their catalyst. I'm referring to what it will be, meaning what is actually going to cause them to say, "Okay, look, we can't keep, we can't do this." I'm saying it's credit spreads. I don't think they can go to hold a press conference and say high yield bond spreads widen too much. We we have to slow down. I don't think they can say that. Yeah. But I'm, I I do believe that's what it will mean, and it doesn't have to be just in the corporate debt market. It could be in any form of credit instrument. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think it would be. Well, I mean, taking aside the fact that it, this thing could escalate, that that would cause them to stop too. Um, you know, if it gets really bad and it gets real there, and there's a full blown war and, and NATO's involved and all of that, I, I think the Fed would just stop. I, I think I think they would not raise rates in that environment. Um, and uh, but aside from that, from an economic perspective, um, I think you'd start to see them. I, I, they're going to raise on Wednesday, and that's already done. Uh, I think they get a couple more in there. You get credit spreads that start to blow out. You have market volatility. You have an inversion of the yield curve, and you have Ukraine getting a little worse, not better. Um, mm. I don't think they turn around and do a 180 and go back the other way and start cutting necessarily. But I think I could think they could stop and pause and not do a quarter here. You know? Are you more concerned uh, as far as? Uh, are we drawing a distinction between the winding down of the balance sheet and the the raising of the rates? Or well, those are two different um, manifestations of tightening or loosening, and so we could talk about either one. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm generally of the view that they can't really focus on tightening of the balance sheet until they get off the zero bound, and that they don't really want to do both at once. But see, you can you have to you can't raise rates passively. You have to actively raise a target to then go affect open market operations to move to that target rate. You can passively reduce the balance sheet with roll-off. Which mm -hmm. is what they plan on doing. I right? think that that's what they'll do. Okay. That's the most benign way to do it, I yeah. think. And it makes sense, and it can go on for – it will. It will go on for – it could go on for decades. I mean, For they, those they oh, listening, I should clear, define roll-off is um, that they bought a bunch of bonds – sit on their balance sheet. They're the holder of the asset. The treasury is the holder of the liability. When the bond comes due, it gets paid off. And then instead of reinvesting, they just extinguish the bond. And remember, the average maturity on the Fed's balance sheet is not 20 years. Oh, it's like not it's, even it's, 20 minutes. No, it's like 2.7 years. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. which, which, that's so, the average, which means you got a lot of six-month paper. Yeah, and so the, the roll-off can be significant. I actually, I'm not in the camp necessarily, unless there's a right tail event, something really changes with markets or inflation gets even bigger than it is or something like that. I'm not so sure they're going to go, go and actively sell bonds. I actually think that the most likely outcome is that they're going to raise rates, try to get to 1% on Fed funds, and then let the balance sheet just organically reduce itself, which it will. I mean, if they do nothing, it'll reduce itself over. over. In fact, it's an analysis I'll have to come up with on Thursday's DC yeah. Today. But um, I bet it will take a couple of years, and then it gets back down to, you know, a real reasonable $6 trillion. <laughs> um, so, Dan, what's your, what's your guess here? What does Fed do this year? Uh, as far I think that they go through, uh, it's it's so dependent on uh, you know on how the uh, you know the geopolitical and economic situation unfolds. But as far as uh, but as far as uh, if things kind of stay in the state that they're in, which is unlikely, uh, I I believe uh, there will be uh, I believe there will be three rate hikes or less, and they will continue with the winding down of the balance sheet. What was the over under on the little uh, fun thing we got together on I the ten year treasury? I have to check mine. I think it was t it was t two. Yeah, two percent. Was it two percent? Mm -hmm. Okay, it right. closed at the number I chose today. <laughs> just, two fourteen. Just, just FYI, actually, it was two seventeen. Two seventeen. Oh, we got a bit to go. Or two twenty seven. I, I um, I, I'm gonna ask you then uh, a third. Okay, so we we covered the possibility of energy having a surprise outcome in the way it it kind of plays out in the aftermath of Russia Ukraine. We've talked about the Fed and where it could enforce, enforce those things. Um, now, let me ask you a question. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 mean, meaning it's a guarantee it will happen, um, and, and uh, 1 means there's just no chance. Mm. We come out of this with a better U.S.-China relationship. Wow. Wow, that's a great question. Because China ends up standing up to Putin a little bit more than expected. I'm not saying they come out and they like go arm in arm with Xi and Biden in a press conference challenging Putin to a push-up contest. But I will say 
If that happens, I'm to- I'm taking Putin. <laughs> <laughs> Just so real. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I, agree with you there. I do. I do think it's possible that China can play this thing in a way that actually helps them and is good PR for them. And I totally disagree with people who think that doesn't matter to them. I think that they desperately want acceptance in the world stage for the purpose of their own strategic mandate, which is better validation of their currency. And um, to some degree on the margin, uh, belittling the dollar's strength as world reserve currency. I think it's a huge issue for China and they cannot do it if they're a foreign policy pariah like Putin now is. And I, I hope you're right. And uh, as far as right tail events, I think that would be, for in my book, that would be the right tail event. Is that somehow we come out of the end of this year with better U.S.-China relations than we've had over the last five or so, uh, which would be an amazing uh, turn of events and uh, and definitely a boon for the global economy and markets. I think it's I think it's unlikely, uh, but I do agree with the incentive that that China has in order to uh, kind of bolster their their uh, their global standing and be at, at that level of influence that they want to be at. This is a unique opportunity for them to uh, to create a piece where where they're the only ones in that opportunity to do so. There's there's no other country that has the leverage that they they have right now, and I, I don't know how they plan on using it. Uh, I don't know enough about the uh, how uh, how much China is willing to uh, uh, what China is willing to do in order to bolster their standing on the global stage, and whether that means trying to find a deal or how China is working in the backgrounds right now with Russia in order to uh, move negotiations forward. I don't know if if uh, Beijing is in the background pulling strings right now, and it, and how they want to to come public with some of it. So. Uh, it's a point of uncertainty for me. I just I hope it happens, uh, but I'm I'm giving it a, a low a low chance. I mean, I think that China has shown to basically act in its best interest every step of the way. So if it is better for business for China, I think that they will support Russia. I don't think that's the case though, and I think what they've learned is they've seen the playbook of how unified and powerful the West can be against with economic warfare. Basically, you know, I know they don't want that, and, and obviously it's a different country. Um, and, and from a size of, of economy and all of that than Russia is. But the point is, I just see it in, your, in their best interest to be a, a nicer global player. And maybe that unifies the, the East and West a little bit. Um, but even if they just did nothing, they didn't really, you know, they're already in talks with Russia, right? Just as you said, what if they just sort of did nothing for a while? Eventually, I think that the sanctions really will work on Russia. And I think it does start to fall apart, in which case Russia or China sort of saves face. It's not like they backed out and they said, you know, we told you that we would help and we did, you know, and then we decided not to. It just says, you know, we didn't do it in the time that it would take to help you necessarily. And even that would be something that would be a positive for the for the U.S.-China relationship technically, which yeah. is yeah, which I think is more likely. I think China is just great at playing the long game on everything. But but they wouldn't be celebrated. They wouldn't get the, the level of no, notoriety that David would be talking about in that in that case. No, uh, no. The, well, the, right, they wouldn't get the PR from it. I, I guess is what I'm saying. They wouldn't, but it would be slightly to the positive. So doing nothing actually errs on the side of it being positive, which is what I think they'll do. Um, if they go out and do the opposite and they sort of double down on we're with you and it was wrong to invade in Ukraine and and we're on that side and and the China relationship uh, U.S. relationship gets better, like the right tail risk thing. That's a right tail risk uh, or benefit. Yeah. You know that can happen, but that's why it's right tail. It's not really that likely. Aren't they doing nothing right now? Would you? And they're getting really bad press for it. From they're the doing the nothing. It's been a couple of weeks. Okay. You know, I, I think they so give, give it time. Yeah. They didn't oppose the UN condemnation. They didn't support it either. Right. They abstained. But mm-hmm. I mean, they're. Yeah, I think I think Brian's right. It's a little too early to say what they're doing actively, but they're. Um, they're probably more engaged in conversation with Moscow than than uh, the Western NATO countries are, the the European countries are. I would I would say there's a left tail risk here too. I think um, the scenario I paint is entirely possible. It could be also uh, an evolution. You know, there's sort of a continuum where it could be that there's just some improvement in U.S.-China relations. Not that's something in markets. But it could be that there's this like breakthrough thing. I think it's highly unlikely, but th- that would be a big deal. But it also could be the other way that like China takes a very belligerent stance, or that China stays fully neutral in it, and then co- but then comes out of it with a playbook on how they can act like Putin in the future, like what wh- what their future with Taiwan may be, how they want to control 
Um, they still have a lot of leverage over U.S. technology manufacturing. It's a totally unwritten story about how much of the supply chain issues come down to their productive incapacity. You know, they still are largely a sh- – there's a lot of shutdowns in their country that now we've kind of moved past. They haven't. Even this last week there's been new breakout mm. issues. And so I think it's a wild card. Um, I don't I, – I, for the right tail risk to be like a 10, um, they have to like come out and say we're, we're abandoning communism. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean that's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. But that would that would be uh, that would be pretty good. I'd go like Dow 40, 46, <laughs> I would um, agree with you. But I also think it is entirely possible there's a more marginal victory in it, and and uh, I would not uh, pay much attention to people that think they know exactly how Xi is going to play this because yeah. I don't I don't think they do. I think right now the market is pricing in a, a bad scenario with uh, U.S. and China. Yeah. Judging w- especially what I've seen in uh, you know the Chinese st- stock market, I mean, it's been uh, very very much sold off uh, very strongly. Um, so I think the market is pretty pessimistic on it right now. Uh, that being said, it there is I think in that area. A uh, sig- uh, significant amount of uncertainty, and if you if you make that marking call and you're right, uh, it could be very profitable. Yeah. All right. So we've covered um, some of the kind of tail sides of where this conflict is, with uh, the potential impact in energy, the potential impact in interest rates and Fed policy, potential impact with China. Uh, as we wrap up, then maybe Dea say what's most on your mind right now in markets unrelated to Russia, Ukraine. What's lingering out there you find most interesting as we sit here in the middle of March, uh, waiting for the first quarter of this new uh, year to end? Um, in in my mind, I, I, I'm asking myself: Is this time uh, different as far as the geopolitical geopol- landscape goes? Uh, is this a key moment in uh, world history uh, that we will look back on for the next 30, 40 years and say, "Okay, well, these nations stood on this side, and these nations stood on that side," and all these supply chains got rerouted and uh, allegiance, allegiances were restructured and so on. Uh, or it was just a moment where the West came together and really solidified things uh, for Western societies for the years to come. I, I don't know. Uh, and, may, and maybe it's, uh, you know, you, this thing gets settled uh, or we become desensitized to it. Like you said, it ends up being not a non-event. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but it's something I, I find very interesting, uh, but it's difficult to speculate on. All right, so um, potential paradigmatic shift in the foreign landscape, uh, the geopolitical landscape, most on Dea's mind. Brian, what about you? So setting Russia, Ukraine aside a yeah. little bit, I think um, you know I, I think that inflation numbers ultimately will roll over, and they'll roll over pretty soon. Um, I think that is soon Q two, Q three. No, um, I would say some time before the end of the year. Okay. So Q three, Q four type of type of type right. of deal. Um, and so, you know, inflation numbers rolling over a little bit, Fed not being quite as hawkish as they maybe were feared to be. Um, and then having, like I said, again, I mean, fundamentals come out in this country and be not necessarily a right tail benefit or, or a right tail event where it's, 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 a, it's a boom, but really kind of backing the, the valuation in markets now where you still have low rates, um, you have lower inflation and you have economic growth that is far more than, than we thought household formation, um, you know, the amount of job openings that are out there once they start getting filled, um, all of that. So I, I setting right, the bad stuff aside with, with the geopolitical event, which I, I like your comments, Dave, because I, I do think that that's a real issue um, mm. with, the, with the world stage changing a little bit. But those are some of the things uh, at home economically that I'm looking at. Cool. cool. Yeah, I, I uh, agree. And I actually would say that um, I think in a lot of ways, even if this conflict doesn't go to a place where we go, wow, that, that altered the history books. It's already altered um, some domestic understandings of the world order. Uh, there is right now in this moment, so we don't need to know if this plays out. It's already kind of happened that there is on the right in the American political uh, ecosystem um, a shocking distrust of the international order of NATO. Um, I it's think unbelievable. I think yeah. that some of those things are, are in a post-World War II world are staggering to me. How did, how did that happen? Yeah, um, I hesitate if I should answer this on Divinity Cafe. I almost feel like I want to answer in one of my other mediums yeah, because I'm sure it's a long. Yeah, but but long I mean, time. I don't think I'm going to offend anyone by it. But it, it happened because um, populism isn't a coherent ideology. Mm. It, it's a res- by definition, it, they even put it in the label. It's a response to what is popular, right? That and, and it's not a great way to formulate policy. 
And so through various decisions that have been made, and a lot of which are poor decisions and executed poorly, um, with a lot of angst in the public square, uh, there is enough distrust. There's always been a lot of that, but now I think it's on steroids globally, and it's also both on the right and the left, just maybe for different reasons. Mm. And so that distrust carrying into the international order is a little different than like people not believing the National Institute of Health on stuff. Like I think the FDA and CDC have always been pretty fallible, made big mistakes. COVID allowed them to kind of look on a public stage as really incredibly fallible and a little bit unimpressive actors in some cases. But most of the time we haven't looked at uh, things like NATO or just the concept of an international order as a means of defending against, you know, the expansion of rogue states or bad actors. For the most part, there's been a pretty unanimous consensus that we that post World War II we didn't want that, yeah. and uh, that seems to be changing in some in some camps. And uh, I don't say that approvingly, yeah. but I, I would say with markets, um, I want to go back to stuff we talked about in January. I'm pretty sure this value thing out of uh, growth rotation into value is going to be years to come. It's going to continue playing out for years. I think that um, some of the carnage we're seeing in the shiny objects has not just been a big sell-off followed by a huge V-shaped rebound. Some of it is taking another leg down. Some of it uh, is getting repriced in a way that seems very secular to me. There's a lot of similarities with what happened in NASDAQ in, in March 2000. Mm. Um, you have a yield curve right now that basically... I said earlier, I think credit spreads hold the Fed in check, but really the yield curve probably does as well. This will be, besides 1999, which I will add, after that Fed tightening cycle beginning, it did the economy did go into recession, and you did have a two-and-a-half-year bear market, and you did have 9-11 and dot-com implosion. You had a lot of bad things happen. But I think the yield curve then was 15 basis points, and right now it's like 30 and the average, um, I read today in a Strategus report, the average yield curve spread going into a tightening cycle has been about 90 basis points. So I don't think there's a lot of room no. to bring the short end up. And I just don't think, um, I don't think that this is a good environment to be in overpriced securities. I think cash flow and value and balance sheets, really boring stuff matters. So some, of the, some of the sectors that have benefited most, including in our own portfolios, they, they fit in those categories of being more value-oriented and being more cash-oriented and being more dividend-oriented. But energy and financials are hardly non-cyclical, hardly boring. I think maybe utilities, consumer staples, I think they end up getting a little play here, healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, and that and that is kind of a post uh, similar to what you saw with dot-com. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I wish I could take, for the listeners, take a, an opposing view to what you said, but I have... I full heartedly believe in it myself as well. We'll so, save our opposing views for the March Madness. There we go. Yeah. There we go. But um, I, I do. I think so too. I think this is the uh, first first part of the first inning uh, of that of that rotation, and um, for all the reasons that you've said. And technically, there was. I mean, if you look at the yield curve now, you're right. It's like 30 basis points yeah. if that. If, if that, it's been between 25 and 30 for a week, yeah. couple of weeks. Um, I did notice actually on my fact set screen today. Sevens and tens were actually inverted, which I thought was kind of interesting. Not a big deal. Not a lot of seven year. Yeah, people don't look at it too much. But technically, they were inverted by a couple of basis points. Mm. I just think that it's trying to price in things it doesn't know. And if it was just a tightening cycle, it'd be one thing. But it's not. It's a geopolitical thing too. So it's that's true. Tough, tough to get. I I I agree. I think that the the re, the repricing some of those uh, high flyers we've seen has been very dramatic. I mean down 70%, 80%. I mean, some of these numbers are staggering. And, uh, you know, a lot of these names that were high-flying growth names are starting to look like value names themselves, at least the ones that are cash flowing. So, uh, yeah, it, it does appear to Two be... Two camps there. There's some that have gotten hammered that look like value names. Yeah. That was the case with the world's largest software company and the world's largest chip company. Back in the day, they got hammered and then they really became value stocks. But then now there's some of those growth names got hammered and then they're still at 60 times. Right. Yes, that was yes, always my yes, argument is yes. be careful of companies that get slaughtered and they're still drastically overpriced. No, some of them are still dra – I, I completely agree. Because all that means is yeah. for all you know, a bottom is nowhere near inside. Yeah. 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 That's a great point. Yeah.
All right. Well, on that cheery note, uh, allow me to wrap it up. And I'm always grateful for the time of day and Brian. So you guys are aware we have conversations like this. We uh, have text threads and emails and conversations and telephones every day. But every now and then we get to be in the same studio room together and put a camera on ourselves and uh, fight things out. And and uh, hopefully this, uh, this discussion has been fruitful for you. Uh, we're very appreciative of you watching and listening to the Dividend Cafe. And we hope that you will subscribe uh, and and give us a uh, rating uh, because it helps move the needle in how people can find the podcast. And, and so thank you for your viewership of the Dividend Cafe. We look forward to coming back to you again soon.